hi, this is Andy with the Mountain Computers. Uh, today is March 3rd, it's Sunday. I've had a couple days off, and uh, I was going back through some of the previous videos that we've done over the past, oh, two, three weeks. And uh, those are really starting to take some traction. So uh, I want people to continue to like and subscribe and share. But tonight um, is a special episode. This is a special video. And uh, I sat down today and I was like, hmm, what can I share that might be fun for people to um, hear and also appreciate in their own kind of way? So today I'm going to talk about the top 10 troubleshooting problems that I've been ex that I experienced over the last 25 years and uh, I'll take each one of them and describe them and also tell you what I learned from it and also how I solved it so number one I was at Microsoft in 1991 taking phone calls eight to nine hours a day and I got this one call and it was a lady who called me and said I can't print well, back in the day, we didn't have the internet, and a lot of people um, just didn't have any good documentation or troubleshooting uh, training classes. So she calls me, and I go, hi, it's Sandy from Microsoft Product Support, uh, and I was in Word, Microsoft Word. She said she couldn't print. So I said, okay, so when was the last time you print? printed? And she said, before I went to lunch. And I said, oh, really? I said, okay, so you were printing before lunch, and you came back from lunch, and you can't print. And she said, yes. And I go, well, what happened during lunch? She goes, oh, nothing. I mean, we have a temp that comes in, a temporary employee. And I said, oh, okay. So a temp came in, and she's no longer there now, right? She goes, that's correct. So then I said, okay, so, uh, so how do you print? And she says, oh, well, we have this little AB switch. And anybody who knows what an AB switch is, back in the day, printers were parallel on parallel ports from the back of the computer. Well, in order for one printer to be shared between multiple computers or one computer to multiple printers, you had this switch that went from A to B. So anyhow, I said, really? I said, well, that adds a little uh, subtlety to the problem. So I said, can you check the cables? She goes, why would I do that? I said, I don't know. I just, this, that's the first thing I always do when you can't print. And today I say, are you wired or wireless? And if you're wired, then I say, well, check the cables. Well, lo and behold, she puts the phone down to check the cables, and I hear this, that B word. <laughs> and I'm on the other end listening, I'm going, and she says, that? I was like, wow. And she gets back on the phone with me, and she says, uh, yeah, the temporary uh, employee couldn't figure out how to use the AB switch, so she just unplugged the printer cable from the printer and plugged it directly into the computer she was using and didn't put it back. So that was my first um, experience with uh, printing problems and that was in 1991. So that was that was a good troubleshooting experience. So we hung up, she said thank you and we went on our way. So that was a good one. So number two, the laptop won't boot. Um, so what happens when laptops don't boot, um, I can tell you right now, I always ask people, well, when was the last time you had it on? Oh, last night. And I go, well, is it, this is the first time or has it been multiple times? Oh, it's been, this is the first time, but I think it happened a couple weeks ago. And I said, well, pop the battery out and then just run it on the charger. And uh, they're like, what? I go, yeah, the battery, the battery in the back of the laptop. So they were like, hmm, okay. I said, well, I normally run it with the uh, power cable plugged in anyhow. I don't really need the battery. So anyhow, lo and behold, there's a couple things you need to understand. If you take the battery out of the computer, whether or not it's asleep in hibernation or just off, and just use the AC um, adapter that you plug into the laptop and turn it on and it comes on, then I say, okay, so it's working now. Okay, so go ahead and turn it off. And they do that. I say, go ahead and put the battery back in, which they do. And then I say, turn it on. Well, when they try to turn it back on, it doesn't come on. And by just that example, I tell them there's something wrong with the battery. The battery is pulling the, the laptop down, that's the way I describe it, to where it won't boot unless the battery's out. So therefore, just get a different battery. But there's some nuances to that troubleshooting. Um, 
Sometimes you'll have to hold the power button down on the laptop for 10 to 15 seconds or until it powers down completely because it's stuck in a Windows update or it's stuck in hibernation or it's stuck in sleep mode and it's very hard to troubleshoot over the phone. Um, in person it's easy because you can look at the diagnostic lights. You look around and look at the hard drive light, the charging light, um, and that's about it. The power light. Um, sometimes you take the battery out and you take the charger off and hold down the power button just to drain the board on the laptop and by doing so when you let go, you plug the AC adapter in and turn it on, it fires up. So whatever's happened in electrons and energy and electricity is, is magical. It sometimes solves the problem. It just gets more or less frozen or stuck. So that's number two. I hope you're enjoying this. Number three, password doesn't work. Okay, this is a big one. Okay, I watch people when they're... Um, if they're in front of me and they type in their password. It's not that I'm watching them to see what their password is, I'm watching to see how they enter their password, how fast they are, what keys they press, and in what order. Um, because if a password doesn't work, like a PIN number or a password or whatever, um, oftentimes I ask them if it's over the phone, do you have your caps lock on or off? Accounting firms, finance people, um, people who run like old uh, Citrix systems, mainframes, or they have some, you know, terminal. Um, they like to have the caps lock on because of all their invoicing and stuff is all in caps. Um, and so for some reason the caps lock is either on or off when they're doing it and it screws up their password. Um, the other thing that I've noticed with people is the numlock keypad. If you have a keyboard, like this one here, you can see that there's a numeric keypad. So. <clears throat> just looking at this, if you look at this keypad, okay, the numeric keypad right here, I see people using this to type in their password. Uh, that's a no-no. If you're using numbers, see, now these numbers across the top of the keyboard and these numbers are not the same. These numbers are a certain key code. These numbers are another key code. Now, the computer knows this. However, when people are entering in the password and I see them move over to the numeric keypad, I ask them to stop or pay attention to not do that. Because if they change the password and they're not paying attention, say a password policy says change a password, and they do it so quickly that they're not really paying attention and they get it wrong, it's usually because when you go over the top of the keys in the numeric, number of keys 1 through 0, that's different than on the numeric keypad. So don't use the numeric keypad. So that was number three. So passwords, when they don't work, pay attention to the caps lock, the num lock, and the keypad, numeric keypad. Don't use the numeric keypad, just use a standard um, uh, password. Also when it comes to password complexity, I think I have it down here further on down, number nine, and I'll talk about that more. So we'll talk more about passwords shortly. Number four, computer won't boot, or it's slow to boot. Now this is a strange one, where you turn the computer on, screen flashes, starts to start starts to uh, look like do something, and it just sits there. I've had that happen um, to me once or twice in 20 years, and that is when I'm not in my working environment, but somebody else's working environment, and it's the printer or something plugged into their USB port that is holding the computer from doing a power on self test and is trying to boot to that external device in plugged into the USB port. So for this case, um, I've seen HP printers, um, like we've had several clients, where they add a printer or somewhere along the line a Windows update occurs and the printer gets involved and the computer takes 45 minutes to boot and it's plugged into the USB port. But if you unplug the printer, Computer boots fine, and you plug the printer in, then it works. So I can't explain it other than it could be a Windows update, it doesn't happen all the time, but usually if a computer won't boot or it's slow to boot up, it takes a long time, just unplug everything that um, isn't necessary, that, and it's just for troubleshooting. But the only thing you need is power, uh, monitor, and keyboard, and display, video display. That's all you need to really boot a computer, so that's number four. Number five, pop-up blockers or 
tools that um, are called like NoScript or like Privacy Badger, you go to a website and it's got a calendar. This is a common problem that I deal with all the time. Well, you want to be able to see the calendar, but you don't know that the calendar is in, is in what's called an iframe. It's an HTML piece of code to where the calendar is a plugin. Well, I get calls and they say, oh, I can't see this calendar and I can just see it like, like last week. And I said, oh, is your pop-up blocker on or what browser are you using, Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, you know, what have you. And if I have them try a different browser and it works, great. If I have them use Internet Explorer and it doesn't work, then I say, mm, you know, your pop-up blocker might be interfering with it. So usually that happens when people are going to their bank or going to a, a college portal to do their online schooling. So um, sometimes websites won't display properly. Like I have one business client that is a, a, a team roping association. Their calendar for all of their different chapters and divisions, if you have Privacy Badger enabled, which is a tool for blocking malware and cookies and all sorts of other stuff, it, it gives you privacy but it makes it to where the code on the page does not work. Um, so if you turn off Privacy Badger and refresh your page, the calendar shows up. But you turn Privacy Badger back on, no calendar. Troubleshooting 101, whatever's on, turn it off, see what happens. But just temporarily, antivirus, turn it off, see what happens. So that was number five. Number six, you can't, okay, a week ago, I get a, a, a call from somebody and they say, I can't get to my bank. It says um, uh, not secure. And I'm like, really? I'm like, well, what does the date and time on your computer say? They go, what do you mean? I said, look in the bottom right corner, which is down here on your screen. Look, give me the date and time. And they go, what does that have to do with it? And I say, your date and time of your computer has to be within an hour of the website of your bank. Otherwise, the SSL certificate won't come down to your computer in order to secure the communications. That is a known problem. Now, older computers where those little watch batteries, the CMOS batteries, those are CR2032 batteries, if those start to go bad, and they're the same in laptops, some of them are sealed, some of them are just open, but that battery keeps track of the date and time of your computer and what's called the BIOS, the configuration of your computer. When that gets weak or starts to fail, it won't hold the date and time. Now, that's not a problem if you get on the internet because your computer usually will auto update from an uh, internet date and time server. So just something to keep track of. Always note if you're having problems getting to a secure site like your bank or someplace that you know is supposed to be secure, if you can't get there, pay attention to your date and time. How am I doing so far? Good? <laughs> uh, number seven. Uh, what's this one? Oh, I hate this one. This one has to do with the fact that if you go to a website to download something, like my Go Green PC tune-up software, and you get this pop-up from Microsoft that says, run, don't run, and that's it. It doesn't tell you anything else. <clears throat> it just, it doesn't even give you my software or the software you're trying to download by manufacturer name, by digital certificate, even though my software is code signed, for security purposes and reputation factors and all these other things that are required by Windows 10. Microsoft, I believe, um, is just making life difficult for us programmers trying to deliver software to you. Now, Microsoft's own software doesn't really get blocked by Microsoft's protection mechanism. So those folks at Microsoft, please stop doing that. Please fix your pop up and show more of the information of people's software that's installing. If my software has a code signed certificate, show the certificate, show the company name, but don't just say run, don't run because it confuses people. Um, that's more of a rant, but I can tell you one thing. When it comes down to programming software, I know for a fact that there is a less expensive way to get a code signed versus a more expensive way to get a code signed. The less expensive way, it takes three or four months for the reputation of your code signing on your software to be accepted by Microsoft, let alone the rest of the world, and antiviruses. You have to be whitelisted and all this other stuff, rather than blacklisted. Um, please fix this.
folks. Um, I pay for a code signing certificate for a year and it really doesn't work until the third or fourth month after you've released the software with a valid certificate. So I'm going to send this to the Microsoft folks and I'm going to send this to the code signing folks too so they can probably get this fixed because it affects you, the customer, and me, the provider. I have great tools. I want to get them to you, but other companies are in the way. And uh, that's a troubleshooting problem. So if you download my software from my site and it says run or don't run in this little blue pop-up, Go ahead and say run, and then it shows you the certificate of my software and other people's software. And it says, do you want to trust this company that you just downloaded the software from? Yes or no? Then you really should make that decision, but not have somebody else interfering with my software getting to you. I mean, the antivirus will take over, malware bytes will take over, other things will take over if it's bad, but in my case, it's not bad. So that was number eight. Number nine, password complexity. Okay, so this is for all the elderly people, okay, that have a hard time remembering anything. Come on, folks. The password people out there with, um, I'm not a robot, and I got to check all these sidewalks and traffic signs and cars and buses and storefronts. You know that drives elderly people crazy, let alone me too. So I can tell you right now, password complexity it's got to be eight characters long or more with a capital letter and under, under uh, uh, a special character, uppercase, lowercase, with a number. The, the password can't be part of the username. Um, 20 years ago, I wrote software that doesn't require any passwords. And it's still running today. And now the world is just now catching up. Now, when it comes to troubleshooting, I watch a lot of elderly people and their passwords. And passwords like orange, yellow, ball, those aren't good. <laughs> Just make it a phrase, okay? Just say, we love Johnny, or we love our cat, or we love something, or, or um, something. Make it a phrase, okay? Make the password a phrase. And if you have to, uh, make it upper lowercase, to where it's just capital letters of the major, you know, the words. So. When it comes to password complexity, um, it's important to do it. Be consistent. Don't make it the same password everywhere. I hate to say this. Um, if you're into bill pay, um, bill pay, just that's your bank. Make sure your password's strong, but write it down first before you change it. That is one tip that I can, I'm going to tell older people as well as younger people who aren't familiar with computers. Write the password down first and then try it. If it accepts it, great. You got a password down and you can repeat it. If it doesn't work, write a new password vary with a variation of what you had. Try that one. So, um, that's number nine. Sort of a rant, sorry. Um, number 10, laptops and interchangeable parts. This is the last one I'm gonna talk about when it comes to troubleshooting as, as well as computer design. I'm gonna put this piece of paper down because I wanna tell you how important it is and I wanna keep this short. When it comes to computers and laptops particularly, and just like cars, how they're designed, what gets changed in a laptop the most? What do you need the most? There's an AC adapter. There should only be one type of AC adapter in the world for laptops, and it should be the same everywhere. The same voltage, the same tip, the same everything. Why does it have to be 400 different variations? It should just be one. That's Number 10, number 10, troubleshooting, as well as design suggestions to the, the powers that be, okay? Because when it comes to me troubleshooting, the most important thing with an AC adapter with a laptop is the voltage in the tip. The current can be a little more. It really can't be a little less. Otherwise, it'll overheat, and it won't get enough power to do it. And some laptops are more temperamental than others. Some of them just have to be perfect. Otherwise, they won't boot, and they won't charge. So the other part of number 10 um, has to do with laptops and interchangeable parts is the fans, okay? Anything that needs to be maintenance and changed, I want you to, it's like the oil filter on the car. You should be able to change it within five minutes without a mechanic, without me. 
Um, you don't need me to change a battery. You don't need me to change a CPU fan. You don't need me to change the RAM or the hard drive. All of these things should be easily accessible. Dell, they put the hard drive inside underneath on the motherboard where you have to take the whole thing apart. There's other companies that do that, but Dell, you made it in the old days to where you could just pop the hard drive out and put another one in. Why can't you now? The CPU fan. Even Macs, PCs aren't alone. Macs have the same problem. You should be able to just take one couple screws and pull the fan out and put another one in. My vacuum cleaner has a place where you just pop it out, pop in a new you know, fan, new filter. Same thing. Should be easy. Um, screws. All the screws on a laptop should be the same. Um, there's some companies that did a great job. Uh, Toshiba did for a while. Sony did for a while. The same screws everywhere. Not 20 different screws. I watch people do warranty. And I'm talking about troubleshooting here. I mean, because this all is about troubleshooting. This isn't about Andy asking for the world. It's, it, this is real simple stuff. All the same screws, all the same adapters, parts that are accessible. And that's why when I started this company, I wanted to design these computers that solve those things. I wanted to have that computer to where everybody would buy that computer. And all the other designs were consistent. Um, I don't care about the colors. I don't care about the screen sizes and stuff like that. Um, I just care about the fact that it should be easily maintainable, not proprietary. Anybody can change the light bulb. Anybody should be able to change the battery, the RAM, the hard drive, the CPU fan. Even the screen should be easily interchangeable. Um, I hope we get there, but anyhow. That was my number 10. I can't think of anything else when it comes to that. But those are my top 10. Um, I'm not going to go over them real quick, but this is Andy from Mountain Computers. I hope you enjoyed this top 10 troubleshooting um, suggestions, design techniques, and hopefully moving forward, somebody will take this video to heart, somebody who has the power to be, and implement that so the rest of the world can benefit from it, like you and me and, and everybody else watching this. So. Andy from Mountain Computers, there's more to come. Please like, subscribe, and share. Uh, sponsor if you like, but there's more to come. So enjoy yourself. Have a great rest of the weekend, and I will catch up with you in a couple days, if not sooner. Take care. Bye-bye.